I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man, and I'm here to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Yes, boys and girls, it's Comic Weekly time, and here I come right into your house to bring a little fun and happiness. Right out of the pages of Puck the Comic Weekly, straight into your living room, your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. <laughs> this makes funny. How are you today? Oh, I'm just wonderful. And I know why. Why? Because this is an exciting week. Lincoln's birthday and St. Valentine's Day comes this week. That's right. And I don't blame you for being excited. And you know something? My girlfriend, Diane, has a birthday on Valentine's Day. I'll bet you she's excited. Yes, I'll bet you she is. You know, unless people send Valentine's to each other on Valentine's Day, be my Valentine because I love you. Mm -hmm. How did that get started? Well, long ago, people set Valentine's Day aside. It's a special day when you should tell the person you were in love with that you love them. Isn't that nice? So that's how it all started, I guess. Isn't that nice? And so today, we send Valentine's to people we like, too, so we can let them know we're thinking of them, even though they aren't the ones we love the most. Isn't that nice? Yes, it is nice. Now you know what I'm going to do. Read me the funny? That's exactly what I'm going to do. That's nice, too. Yes, Puck the Comic Weekly. And I'll read that in just a moment. But before I do, let's listen to this nice man. Well, here we go with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the first page, hop along, Cassidy. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. Six guns blazing as he thunders along. Give us music for Hop Along. Hoppy and his pals, California and Lucky, had come upon a herd of stolen cattle in a canyon. And then they had a brush with the cattle thieves. And while Lucky and California deliver the herd of cattle to the Bar 20 ranch, Hoppy had gone off in pursuit of the leader of the rustlers. Hoppy was knocked unconscious when driven into a limb of a tree, and his unconscious body was left in a runaway rig, which was brought him into town safely. Now, he's come to see his friend Buckskin, who's in bed. Last picture top row, Buckskin says, Hey, sounds like you had a run-in with a chameleon. Hoppy replies, Now, a chameleon's a lizard that can change color to match its surroundings. Buckskin continues, Yep. This two-legged lizard hides behind a thousand disguises. No witness has ever described him the same way twice. All started shortly after you went away. And he tells Hoppy that one day a flashily dressed passenger held up a bank messenger aboard an inbound stage. A little later, an old-timer with battered clothes held up Moss Briggs General Store. Two nights later, a tall stranger set fire to a neighbor's barns and made off with 50 head of first prize horses. Buckskin goes on, first picture bottom row. Well, things got so bad, a Citizens Protective League was formed by a newcomer named Simon Grief to safeguard folks. Well, some of us didn't feel like paying for protection that the law owes us. And then last week, I was shot in the leg while bringing in the Bar 20 payroll. It'll delay my trip to Wyoming for a spell. Hoppy nods and says... Well, the next slug may permanently delay it, Buck. Now, at that moment, last picture, a bullet crashes through the window and plows into the bedboard just an inch above Buckskin's head. Goodness gracious me. Hoppy was awfully close to being right. If that shot had hit Buckskin, he would not have gone to Wyoming. I should say not. My, it's so dark outside. I don't see how they can find out who shot it. Oh, well, that shot is as mysterious as all of the holdups that Buckskin has been telling Hoppy about. Well, I hope that Hoppy finds out who the chameleon is pretty soon if he goes around shooting through windows. Yes. Well, now... Oh, now, now can we go over the page where we'll find Prince Valiant, I bet you. We certainly can, I bet you. See, I win. Yes. I was right. Here he is. And today, Prince Valiant's going hunting. And he's going to take Arf along. Arf's that nice young boy who's so faithful to that. Yes, so now let's see what kind of a hunting trip they have. Here we go with Prince Valiant in the days of King Arthur. Hackett, Breckett, Gray Mulkin, and Quince. Music romantic for a fair, fair prince. <laughs> Now, 
Val, Arf, and a servant leading a pack horse are heading into the hills for the farther borders of fuel. Last picture top row, he comes to the distant outpost, the wall that guards the country. And there at the watchtower, they're greeted by the guards who are grateful that their prince would come and share their lonely watch. And then they continue on their way. Rain begins to fall. All day it falls. They ride through hills that are filled with mist. And as the rain bears down, the streams are filled to overflowing, and the waters rush more rapidly to the sea. The hunters come to a river which they must cross. First picture, second row. Val knows the danger of rising water, and he approaches a ford cautiously, probing the bottom of the stream with his staff, making sure it's not too deep to cross safely. And then they begin to make the crossing. When they're in midstream, suddenly they see a huge tree carried swiftly at them by the rushing waters. Last picture, second row, the guide shouts a warning. A useless warning for the horses, belly deep in the turgid flood, cannot leap away from the approaching doom. And in a second, the tree crashes into them. Last picture, the guide who was last in the water and closest to shore escapes and crawls ashore in time to see Prince Valiant and Arf and the animals being swept to the edge of a waterfall. And he stares horrified as he sees them disappear in the awful tumult. Ooh, who would have thought that such a thing as a hunting trip could be so dangerous? Yes, who would have thought it? It just goes to show that sometimes the worst enemy of all is nature. The wind and the rain and the storms. And that's something people can't fight at all when it becomes real hard. I should say not. When nature goes on the rampage, it's worse than wild animals or wild men. Yes, and Val's certainly finding that out. I hope he doesn't get carried over that waterfall because there are rocks below and they might get killed on them. Well, I hope he doesn't either, but, but we'll find that out next week. Now let's turn over the page and see who's there. All right. Oh, here on page, page five is Flash Gordon. Yes, sir, Flash Gordon, and he's having trouble fighting nature, too. Yes, he's trying to save the chief city of Mars from a flood. He had dived out of the rocket ship into the water to set an explosion so he could blow open a... A, a uh, channel for yes. the water to escape. Yes, that's right. But then Queen Menta refuses to pick Flash up. And she left him in the water to die. But then Dale was awfully smart, and she got the queen's gun away from her, and she's making them bring the ship back to save Flash because he's unconscious in the water. Yes, but what's worse, Flash is being attacked by a whip sharp, a fish almost as big as a whale. So let's read, please, and, and we'll see if Dale saves Flash. Very well, here we go with Flash Gordon. Riga riga doon doon, Saskimatash. Let's have music for heroic Flash. <laughs> While Dale anxiously cruises above the Martian flood water searching for Flash, Flash is suddenly jolted back to consciousness by the powerful lunge of an attacking whip shark. Though still dazed, Flash instinctively fights for his life. Last picture top row, Dale sees Flash. She orders the pilot to fly down and rescue him. But first picture bottom row, in her concern over Flash's plight, Dale relaxes her vigilance against the enemies that are back. Suddenly, the ruthless queen springs forward, and Dale is hurled bodily out of the cockpit, straight toward the whip shark's flashing tentacles. Manta sees her chance for a complete triumph over the hated intruders from the Earth. Taking over the steering controls, she issues a terse order to the pilot to throw the other Earthmen to the shark, too. But young Link is rapidly shaking off the effects of the neutral ray shock, and last picture, mustering all his strength, Link springs into furious action in a desperate effort to rescue his friends. As Link and the pilot fight savagely within the cramped quarters of the scout ship, they shatter the instrument panel, short-circuiting the power beams. There is a shower of sparks, and the craft begins a sickening plunge toward the waters below. when Queen Menda pushed her out of the ship. Why wasn't she more careful? I feel the same way. Now things are in a terrible state. Yes, now the ship's been broken and it's falling to the water. How will they escape if it's destroyed? Well, that's something we'll have to wait until next week to find out. But now let's turn over the page and see if we can find something to take your worries away from Flash and Dale. Oh, look, here's Donald Duck. That can make me stop worrying. That's funny. Very well, then, we'll read this funny. Here we go with Donald Duck and say the magic words with me. Squeegeum, 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 squeegeegeum, sque
Let's have music to better quack quack. Today, Donald's nephews, Louie, Huey, and Dewey, are trying to make up their minds about what to do. Louie says, Hey, let's go skating. Dewey, who's reading a comic book, replies, No, I don't feel like skating. Huey, who's dashing around the floor a bit shadow boxing, with a fierce look in his face, says, Hey, you know what I feel like? Fighting. <clears throat> Louie says cheerfully, Hey, now that you mention it, so do I. Dewey puts down his comic book and says twice as cheerfully, Me too. Huey says, <clears throat> Okay, let's go. Down the street they go, fierce looks on their faces, and their fists all doubled up. <clears throat> they head for the Kelly's house, as Huey says, Lefty Kelly is always ready to fight. And Louie replies, Yeah, good old Lefty. He's dependable. Last picture top row, the hammer on the Kelly door so hard they knock it open. Lefty's mother runs to the door and Huey snarls, Is Lefty in? Lefty's mother answers, I'm sorry, boys, but Lefty has the measles. Now, uh, what do you know? Yeah, the sissy giving in to the measles. Come on, let's go. And down the street they go, heading for Little Top Mike's. But Mike's gone to visit his grandmother. So, down the street they go, heading for Paddy Jones. Oh, he's not home. It's his dancing lesson today. That's right, I... So, they go looking for Sammy Bremer. But he's at a Boy Scout meeting. So, fourth picture, bottom row. As the boys go down the street, Huey frowns at Louie and says, Well, I guess you know what this means. Louie replies, Yeah, we know. Louie hits Dewey. Huey hits Dewey. Dewey hits Huey. And the feathers really fly. <laughs> Wasn't that funny? <laughs> they couldn't find any tough boys to fight, so they had to fight themselves. <laughs> <Yeah>. Ooh, <laughs> wait until Donald sees their torn clothes. Oh, only then they won't be able to fight back. Nope, they'll just have to take it and like it. <laughs> oh, they'll take it, but they won't like it. Well, if they don't mind getting hurt when they're fighting, why should they mind if they're paddled? I don't know why, but it's just not the same. Mm, yes, I think I know what you mean. But now let's go past the Lone Ranger, turn over the page to the very last page of the first section. Oh, look, it's Dick's Adventure. And I'll read that in just a moment. But first, here's that nice man with something interesting to say. Now here we go again with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the last page of the first section, Dick's Adventure. Magic words for the music, please. And say them with me, please. Rickety pack, gazak, gazak. Let's have, have music, music for adventurous Dick. Dick is on an expedition into the wilderness in the early days of America with Captains Lewis and Clark. After spending the winter on the edge of the Missouri River near what is now Bismarck, North Dakota, they're preparing to continue their journey up the wild river. The Indian maiden, who had saved the lives of Dick and his friends by stopping the Indian braves from attacking the white men, wants Captains Lewis and Clark to take her and her husband and her little papoose along with them. But Captain Lewis doesn't want to take them along. However, as the men get aboard their boat, Dick sees the Indian maiden with the papoose strapped to her back coming to the boat. Instantly, Dick is in love with the little papoose, the tiny Indian baby. And he goes over to the two captains... Hey, Captain Lewis, Captain Clark, the bird woman insists on trailing along with us, and she claims she knows his country all the way up to the Rockies. Captain sees the eager look in Dick's face, and he shrugs. Well, all right, all right, let her come along, Dick. But how can she travel with that papoose of hers? We got a thousand miles of wilderness ahead of us. The long journey begins. Last picture, top row, we find them underway, carried forward by the wind which fills their sails. And by the men who push their boat forward with long pulls. And day after day, 
Mile after mile, the party continues up the Missouri, which grows wilder and more turbulent as they cross the border into what will one day be the state of Montana. Several weeks later, on a sunny afternoon, as the men relax in the camp they make alongside the river, Dick is entertaining the little papoose. When suddenly, a bear walks into camp. Instantly, the men seize their rifles and fire at it. Last picture, second row, the gigantic bear is pumped full of lead, but still it charges, maddened with pain and rage. First picture, bottom row, it comes straight at Dick, who is holding the papoose in his arms. There is no time for guns to be reloaded. Dick takes the fastest way out, over the cliff. He pauses one second and leaps into the air, plunging straight down as the men stare in horror. He lands in soft mud and water at the edge of the river and is safe. A minute later, the Indian maiden and Captain Lewis come toward them. And Dick says, last picture. Well, I guess we made it, kid. Well, you can smile now. Here comes your mommy. Oh, that was a wonderful high jump. And you have to be very brave to jump from that high. Yes, you do. That was quick thinking on Dick's part. Yes, I love Dick's adventures. So many exciting things happen. Yes, many exciting things happen to the pioneers who explored and settled this country. But now look below Dick's adventures. Oh, yes. Rusty Riley. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. Gallop and run till the road is dusty. Give us music for his horse and Rusty. <laughs> Sir Percival and Nobbs, two crooked Englishmen who have pretended to be respectable persons had been visiting at the Milestone Farm. While Mr. Miles took Sir Percival to dinner at the country club, Nob slipped back to the farm and stole the valuable trophies from Mr. Miles' safe. The two boys, Rusty and Pete, had seen Nobbs and trailed him in Pete's car, which he wasn't supposed to drive because he's too young to have a license. Detectives have been called in on the case, and they have found the tools under the library window where Sir Percival had told Rusty to leave them. And then Tex tells Mr. Miles that Rusty and Pete are gone. The detective looks at Mr. Miles and says, Well, Mr. Miles, I guess that about wraps it up. The way that wall safe was pried open with that wrecking bar looks like an amateur job. And those two kids taking it on the lamb in their car. Well, that's it. And the officer in uniform adds, Yeah, all we got to do now is to put out a general alarm to pick them up. They can't get far. Mr. Miles shakes his head, saying, I can't believe it, Inspector. I feel that it is merely a coincidence that the boys are gone. The officer says, I, I know how you feel, sir. But I'm afraid it's just wishful thinking on your part. Anyhow, the lab's report on the fingerprints and the cold chisel and pinch bar will cinch it. Well, I, I'll have to have positive proof, gentlemen. However, the boys should be picked up. I, I, I forbade young Peters to take that car out on the highway. A little later, last picture top row in Tex's room, Mr. Miles and Tex are talking things over. Mr. Miles says, Tex, if this matter concerned Rusty alone, nothing in the world would convince me he'd steal. But young Peters, after all, how well do we know him? Hey, boss, that youngster was a spoiled brat when he came here. But he's like a new lad since he's had Rusty for a pal. But don't worry. We'll soon have him back. Meanwhile, first picture bottom row on the highway, Nobbs and Sir Percival approach an old, old abandoned house. The car slows down as Nobbs says... Here's the place I had in mind first, this old deserted house. Sir Percival replies, Oh, excellent, Nobby. We can hide the loot there, and then return this rented car to the owners. They turn off the road and slowly approach the old house. Some distance back on the highway, Pete and Rusty and Pete's car are still trailing Sir Percival. Rusty exclaims, Hey, hold it, Pete. They turn into the driveway of that old house. Pete says, Okay, I'll hide this car behind that barn, and then we'll follow. A little 
elevator, Pete and Rusty have hidden their car behind a lean-to. Rusty, standing behind the shed, has been watching. He says, They took that bundle in the old house. Now they're coming out. Keep in the shadows, Pete. About this time, in the police lab last picture in town, the detective asked the fingerprint expert, Anything to report on the prints on that pinch bar and coal chisel? The expert replies, Oh, yes, Inspector. Good, clear prints on both of them. And they match the prints on the brush and comb taken from Rusty Riley's room. Guess he's your pigeon. Oh, that's Sir Percival. I could choke him. It's all his fault that they think Rusty Riley's to blame because he told Rusty to put the tools under the window and then he wouldn't let Nobs touch those tools. Do you remember? I remember very well, and you haven't forgotten a thing. Oh, how could I forget when a grown man tries to make it look like a nice little boy would steal something? That's the meanest thing I know. I think you're right. I hope Rusty comes back home soon and, and tells Tex and Mr. Miles where the thieves have hidden their stolen stuff, and then Tex will just fix everyone good. Well, we'll find that out next week. And now let's go to the second section of Puck the Comic Weekly. I have it right here on the front page. Dagwood and Bundy. <laughs> They're so funny. Yes, and now here we go on the second section of the first page with Dagwood and Blondie. Rama foo, rama fum, zim zim zombie. Conjure me music for Dagwood and Blondie. You took my brush. I did not. It's mine. Now you Blondie back. rushes in and tells Dagwood. Our children are quarreling again. It goes on all the time. Dagwood shakes his head. How can we teach them that brothers and sisters should love each other and not quarrel? Last picture, top row. Blondie is struck by a wonderful idea. You and I act as though we're having a fight. A good idea. And then we'll see what a horrible thing it is for members of the family to, uh, to fight. First picture, second row, Blondie says. Now remember, dear, we're just doing this for our children and that I love you. Oh, I understand. Now don't hold back. We want this to look real. Just then, Cookie comes into the room. Dagwood, seeing her, gives Blondie a shove and yells, So, you use my fountain pen again, huh? Don't you dare shove me. Use my thumb, Ben. I will push you. Last so you picture, second row. Cookie dashes into the kitchen where Alexander is making a sandwich. Hey, quick, Alexander. Mom and Pop are having a terrible fight. Oh, I can't believe it. Not our mother and father. They love each other. Both the kids come into the living room where Blondie is beating up on Daddy. They hear Blondie say... Take that and that and don't you dare ever push me. For once, I'll give you something to make you remember it. And then they see Blondie take a chair and break it over Dagwood's head. Cookie yells, Stop, Mama, stop! And as Cookie, her blondie, stands above the unconscious body of Dagwood, first picture bottom row, Alexander says, And you and Daddy shouldn't fight, Mama. It's not right. Daddy and I weren't really fighting. We just pretended so you could see how terrible fighting really is. And Alexander drops to his knees and says, I promise you I'll always be real sweet to my sister. And Cookie drops to her knees and says, Yeah, we've learned our lesson, Mama. And last picture... They carry poor, beaten-up Dagwood to the sofa. And Blondie says... I'll get some bandages. And Alexander says admiringly, Gee, Mom, you got a peach of a right. And Dagwood groans, eh, I'd hate to get in a real fight with her. My goodness, look at Dagwood. He's almost broken to pieces. <laughs> yes, Blondie certainly does have a good right. The way she hit Dagwood on the jaw, you'd think she learned to fight from Joe Lewis. Yes, didn't they look awful fighting like that? They did. And I hope Alexander and Cookie remember the lesson they just learned. So do I. It's not nice to fight. Well, I'm glad to know that you don't think it is. No, I don't like to fight. When I see children fighting, it just makes me so mad I could spank them off. Mm-hmm. Well, now look underneath Roy Rogers. Oh, let's read that because Roy's a wonderful fighter, too. I thought you don't like to see people fight. Oh, well, it's different with Roy's fights. He only fights bad men. Yes, that's different. Roy received a message last week, so let's find out what that message was about. Here we go with Roy Rogers. A yip -a -yo. Now here we go with Roy and Trigger. A yip -a -yo. Roy has received a message to come to the Bunyan logging camp. He stops on a hill and sees in the valley below some shacks, and he says... Well, I reckon that's the Bunyan logging camp, Trigger. We better get down there and find Wildwood O'Dowd. 
Suddenly, there's a shot, and the twig Roy is holding between his teeth is cut in two. Roy turns around and sees a girl stepping from behind a tree. Roy shakes his head and says, I should have known that was your shooting, Wildwood. Hey, where'd you pop from? Last picture, top row. As they start walking down the hill together, Roy asks, And what are you doing up here in the timber country? Wildwood tells Roy she's working for her aunt, who runs the logging camp, and that there's been a lot of accidents lately. So many accidents that her aunt can't deliver logs to the sawmill. And poor Wildwood guesses that that means that she can't make enough money. And then they hear the sound of an axe. And ahead of them, they see a man chopping a tree. And then they see Wildwood's aunt come up to the man, take the axe away, and swing at the tree herself. And then they hear her say, You blasted bloomers all alike! Slow as black strapped molasses! I'll show you how to fell this big one! And then the tree begins to fall. It falls directly toward where Roy and Wildwood are. Roy leaps in the saddle, grabs Wildwood, yelling, Hey, come on, Trigger, move! The last picture, Pauline yells, Hey, watch out, you two! It's a sidewinder! You'll get mashed and pulled! Ooh, that's terribly dangerous. That tree is falling right towards them. Right for them, and it's almost on top of them. Do you think they'll ever get away in time? Well, I'm afraid we'll have to wait until next week to find that out. Yes, isn't that too bad? But don't worry too much. Remember that Trigger is a very, very fast horse, and maybe he'll jump away just in time. Now, that's all the time I have, but before I go, here's that fellow with some more interesting information. Well, honey, and all you boys and girls, I gotta go now. Mr. Connick, Wiggly Man, but I'll be waiting for you next week. Okay, that's a date. And a date with all you boys and girls. Be sure to meet me with our little friend, Miss Honey, next week when I read Puff the Comic Weekly. For I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. I'll be back to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Don't forget, boys and girls, see you all next week. Your friend, the Comic Weekly Man. The Jolly Comic Weekly Man.